Nothing remains except my blood. I gave you my life. Now I give you my death. I choose this way to defend you, for my soul will be with you. My name shall be a flag for your struggle. Serene me, I take my first step on the road to eternity, and I leave life to enter history. This is Getulio Vargas, the force behind the nation, the man who was Brazil. The Brazil of Vargas's youth scarcely resembled that of his adult life. Vargas grew up the son of a wealthy and established Brazilian family, a family that descended from early Portuguese gauchos, influential agricultural ranchers who had traditionally held power in post-colonial Brazil. At age 16, Getulio Vargas followed in his father's footsteps by becoming an officer in the Brazilian army. Yet Vargas, from an early age, displayed tendencies to buck convention. In defiance of the national character of Brazil at the time, Vargas set out on a career that could not have been further from that of his ancestors. In 1907, Vargas tossed aside the prospect of a life in the military, instead opting to pursue a career in law. Vargas was never one to remain at rest. In 1909, just two years after completing legal study, Vargas shifted his career towards a life of public service. He began his political career as state deputy of Rio Grande do Sul. Yet it was here where Vargas encountered his first obstacles in his rise to power. Vargas labored as state deputy for 13 long years, when in 1922 he broke into the national scene by being elected federal deputy. Just four years later he became Minister of Finances, gaining him credibility among the populace as a voice of economic reason. Vargas knew the importance of building a strong political base from which to derive his support, and thus returned to Rio Grande do Sul to serve as its chief executive. It was from this point that Vargas began his precipitous rise to power. Over the course of only four years, Vargas had established himself as a prominent political figure. And then came the opportunity for him to take the nation by storm. October 29, 1929. International markets were reeling from the effects of the recent stock market crash. Export prices plummeted, and Brazil was plunged into a state of pessimism and economic despair. So, imagine for a moment that you're the average American man circa 1929. Sit down, read your new morning newspaper. Ooh, stock market crashed. What, what comes crashing down to the floor? Your morning coffee. Now, where'd you get that morning coffee from? The corner luncheonette? No, you got it from Brazil. You know, think America runs on Duncan? America runs on Brazil. Coffee and the Brazilian economy were almost the exact same thing. You know, think the depression hurt Americans? That's nothing! The price of coffee dropped 90% in one year! That might be good news for the guy in the corner luncheonette, but that sure as hell wasn't good news for Brazil! 90% of their primary export was worthless! Brazil was ruined! 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 In the ensuing political turmoil, President Washington Louise was voted out of office. Refusing to relinquish control in face of economic crisis, Luis faced opposition from the military and political establishments. In a military coup, opponents deposed Luis from power. The moment Vargas was waiting for had arrived. Dr. Enrique Pele is chairman of the Women's Studies Department at the University of Kabul. He spent over 50 years studying the Sherpas of southwestern Tibet. President Washington Luis had just lost the 1930 presidential elections, but he did not want to let go of the power. He was nothing more than a sore loser, and a sore loser can never triumph against a truly great man. The people did not want him. The time was right for Vargas to make his move, and Catulia Vargas did just that. He seized power by the horns. He built the base. He allied himself with the very finest of Brazilian political figures. Foreign Minister Oswaldo Arania, Luis Carlos Prestes, all the greatest! Prestes especially 
was so immensely popular among the Brazilian populace that he was called the Knight of Hope. The Knight of Hope, ladies and gentlemen. What an I like to have. It was the Vargas' personal ambition paired with his unstoppable political contacts that catapulted him straight to the top from provincial governor to absolute ruler. In the midst of utter chaos in the nation's capital, and with the support of Brazil's army, Getulio Vargas proclaimed himself dictator of the country. He would remain in power longer than any man in 20th century Brazilian history. However, his hold on power would prove tenuous at first. His initial proclamation of leadership enraged many of his rivals, most prominently Armando de Saez Oliveira, governor of the province of Sao Paulo. Armando de Saez Oliveira presented indubitably the greatest threat to Vargas at this chaotic and primordial stage of his rule. Perhaps if Vargas had not done so at first, Oliveira would have instead been the one to proclaim himself dictator, a missed opportunity Oliveira would come to lament. And so Oliveira challenged Vargas' rule by starting an armed resistance in Sao Paulo circa 1932, quite certainly the most bitter resistance Vargas faced at any point throughout his rule. The key was that Oliveira had the resources to finance such a revolt. Under the presidency of Washington Louise, he had been the main representative of the hegemonic British economic interests. Britain had been the largest investor in the Brazilian economy for decades by the time of Vargas's coup, and though British trade had begun to lose out to Americans and Germans, the Brazilian economy could not hope to stay afloat without British credit. And thus, Nazi Germany, noticing that Britain was providing support to its loyal ally Oliveira, also decided to enter the game of determining whether Vargas would indeed come out on top. Germany thus had great incentive to take control of Brazil, as German industrialists had long been the main competitors of British financiers. Germany never had as much sway over the Brazilian economy as Britain, and now was its chance to reverse that. So, supported by the Gestapo, German industrialists and the Brazilian-Italian banking establishment, such as Plinio Sodalgo, founded the fascist Integralista movement. Vargas was facing opposition backed by the dominant economic powers in Brazil. Vargas may have had the iron on his side, but it was his opposition that had the gold. <laughs> 